Good morning. How's everybody doing today? All right. So a lot of the information that I'm going to give you today is some of the actual information that I share with our own home federal employees. So I'm going to scare you a little bit. I'm going to hopefully enlighten you a little bit and teach you how to raise your fences and, and defend yourself uh, on, the, uh, on the internet and protect your information. So that begs the question, with everything that we've seen in the news, all of the bad stories that you've seen with all of the security breaches and the information that's been leaked, maybe some of your information, your credit card information that might find itself out on the web, there's kind of been this panic mode that you see, um, and it begs that question, is the sky falling? So let me get in, turn this on here. Does anybody in here know the current population of the United States? Any guesses? There we are, 328 million, okay? I promise I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Does anybody know what the United States adult population is? Any guesses? 252 million, okay? This brings me to Equifax, all right? Has anybody read any news articles on Equifax in the last year or two? Has anybody been really upset with Equifax over the last year or two? Right? The personal data of 145 million Americans were exposed by Equifax last year. 145 million. That is 60% of the adult population here in the U.S., okay? Now, this is not your standard security breach that you read about on the news, you know, Target or any of these retailers where credit card information is being leaked out. This is everything about you. This is your, your names, addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers, dates of birth, some credit card information, some driver's license, even your salary history was leaked by Equifax. If that doesn't infuriate you, it absolutely should. And if that doesn't scare you, it should. Because this is the information that somebody will use to steal your identity. They will use it to take out home loans in your name. They'll use it to take out car loans in your name. We won't feel the full effects of the Equifax breach. We won't know the full effects of the Equifax breach for decades because of how that information will creatively be used to hurt you, steal your identity, whatever it might be. Now, there are multiple facets to this. I don't know if you've read the articles, but aside from the actual breach itself and the cover-up of the breach and the delaying of letting the public know that the breach took place, there are other sides to this, like the senior executives at Equifax that in the period before the information went public where they exercised their stock options and cashed out their Equifax stock, some of them got charged with insider trading, some of them didn't. But this also begs the question, here we have one of the major three credit bureaus. Does anybody know what the three credit bureaus are? TransUnion, TransUnion Experian, Equifax, right? And to a lesser extent, you got the fourth, which is Innovus. These companies are not government-held companies. These are, these are private, well, they're public companies, but they're in the private sector. So, whether you choose to do business with them or not, they have all of your information. Now, I ask you, has anybody looked at the stock price of Equifax lately? Now we're more than a year later after the breach. Equifax is doing just fine. All of the Senate committees that took place and all the inquiries into what Equifax was gonna do to, to clean up and, and remedy the situation, all it was was a bunch of questions. They're still operating just like normal. The point that I'm trying to make is that companies like Equifax, they are not going to look out for you. You have to look out for you, okay? So what do we do because of a, a breach like Equifax? We have multiple, multiple facets here or multiple categories of things that you could or should be doing. Number one is credit review. How many people in this room review their credit on a consistent basis? 
contact credit bureaus, ask for credit reports, and review that so you can see what's going, what's going on or, or if there's any uh, fraudulent activity on your credit report. Couple, okay. Credit review is a reactionary. This is something that you do that's reactionary, right? So this is something that you would uncover after the fact. If there was fraud on your uh, credit report, this would be after it's already happened, okay? Next, you have credit monitoring. So if you have a company like LifeLock or one of, one of those uh, many companies that do credit monitoring, that is uh, real time. So it's not reactionary, it's real time. So if something happens on your credit report, uh, they will report that information, they will notify you immediately after that information, um, something major activity comes and then you can review it. Then you've got the credit freeze. Has anybody frozen their credit? One, two, okay. That was the first thing I recommended to my entire family after this breach took place. I told everyone in my family, you need to freeze your credit. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the right decision for you, but what a credit freeze does, you can go to any one of the major three credit bureaus. You can Google uh, Equifax credit freeze. You can Google Experian credit freeze, TransUnion credit freeze, and it will take you to their page where you can freeze your credit. Now, what does freezing your credit do? What that does is if somebody does steal your identity and they want to take out a loan in your name, or they want to uh, go purchase a car or credit card, open credit cards in your name, um, forge documents, those types of things. Many times the credit bureaus are consulted before that information or before that process can get started. If you issue a credit freeze, it's like throwing a wall up, okay? Now let's say after you have a credit freeze on your account, you want to go purchase a car. Well, you have to ask the car dealership, okay, for your financing department, which credit bureau do you pull my credit from in order to give me my car loan? They will tell you which credit bureau you use. You go to that credit bureau and you temporarily, temporarily unlock your credit. And you can do it for a day. And so they unlock your credit so they can pull your credit report. You get the car loan, your credit goes back to being frozen. Okay? Now, there is some information. You, you can Google uh, credit, credit freeze procedures. There's tons of information out there on the government web websites that, that talks about that whole process. And again, I'm not saying that that is the right decision for you. Maybe you decide that credit monitoring is the way that you want to go, or maybe you just want to do credit reviews, but you need to know what your options are. And the fact of the matter is that all of that information about you, yes, yeah, 60% of the adult population uh, is supposedly compromised. I'm going to assume that everybody is compromised. I'm not going to take a chance personally and assume that I'm okay. So I've taken the steps to do that. What else? Yep. Okay, we move on. Isn't it as of September 21st, you can ask for a credit freeze from any one of those companies and they have to give it to free? Correct. <coughs> yes. So the question was, is if uh, after September 21st, if you, have to, if you want to request a credit freeze, they have to do it for free, and that is correct. Uh, up until that point, I think one or two of them would charge like a, like a $5 fee or a $15 fee to do it. Where they might catch you is when you want to unfreeze your credit in order to you know, let somebody run your credit for a loan. At that point, uh, you would have to maybe charge to, they would charge you to unfreeze your credit for that period of time. But they might have done away with that. So that's something definitely worth looking into. Next, the news. <laughs> These companies up here, all of the breaches that we've seen over the this is just a uh, this is just a small sliver of what we've seen in the past couple years. The biggest one that we've seen, not the biggest to date, Home Depot was one of the biggest ones, but the Target breach in 2013. Did anybody have a credit card or debit card compromised from the Target breach? I had mine breached. I had my credit card information stolen twice from the Target breach. My credit card information. So in that one, 70 million customers had their credit card information stolen. And last, just last year, Chipotle had their point of sale systems. So the point of sale systems where you swipe your credit card or insert your chip, uh, your chipped card into the, the reader to, to uh, make a payment. Their point of sale systems were compromised at 2,250 stores. They still don't know to this day how many uh, customer accounts were compromised. Kind of the same thing for Sonic last year. They had 3,600 stores that were compromised. 
They don't know exactly the full numbers of how many people were compromised or their customers. Arby's last year, they had 355,000 uh, customer accounts, their credit card information, debit card information stolen. And T-Mobile just this year had their, uh, their systems compromised. Now, they didn't get credit card information, but they got a personally identifiable information, names, addresses, phone numbers, account info, information, things like that, okay? And this is just, this is just a part of it. This is, this is gonna continue. Because companies, some of these companies, I'm not saying all companies, are going to do the bare minimum, okay, to protect their information. And that's, that's the scary part. That's, that's why I'm standing up here talking to you right now is because we have to take responsibility and, and take some extra steps to protect our information. I know this is hard to see and I don't expect you to be able to read this, but I, I just want to describe it to you. So what happens when credit card information gets stolen? Where does it end up? What do they do with it? This is where it ends up, on the dark web, okay? This is what's called a buy dump. What a buy dump is, is there's, out of all the millions of credit cards that might be stolen in a breach, they get thrown up on the dark web for sale. Do you know what the currency is that they use to buy and sell things like this on the dark web? Bitcoin, because it's anonymous, right? You can't track it. So it's perfect for this type of activity. So what you see up here on the screen, and I know it's hard to see up here, this gives you individual lines for uh, specific credit cards. It tells you the United States uh, is the origin of the card. It tells you the state. It tells you the city. And then you can also get the zip code. Why is the zip code important if you are going to buy a stolen credit card? Does anybody know? Zip code is important because credit card companies and banks have caught on with their fraud departments, right? So if I have a credit card, and my credit card originated in Owatonna, Minnesota, and all of a sudden, one day, I purchase gas in the morning in Owatonna, Minnesota, and two hours later, there's a purchase on my card in Los Angeles, California, that's a problem. The card gets flagged, it gets shut down, and all of a sudden, that stolen card is useless at that point, right? So what typically happens with these credit cards is they'll either make online purchases or the people that purchase them live in the areas of the area code for, or the uh, zip code of the actual card itself so they don't get flagged as quickly. So they can make more purchases before it gets discovered. Other interesting information on here, not only does it tell you the brand of the card, whether it's Visa, MasterCard, American Express, it also tells you the level of the card, debit, credit card. It'll tell you whether it's platinum, classic, business class. Why is that important? The limit, right? So obviously a platinum card is going to cost more than a classic card because the assumption is the platinum card has a higher credit limit. So they're going to charge more for that. And then they're ever so kind to make them refundable. So if somebody goes on the dark web and buys a couple credit cards and they're dead from the start, they can get their money back in Bitcoin. How kind of them for that customer service that they provide just amazing. That's what happens to credit card information. What are some of the tools, and yes, I do have to push a little bit of Home Federal's products here. What are some of the tools that you can use to monitor your accounts so you can quickly head these off at the pass? One of the things that we have for you is called Card Valet. Does anybody in this room use Card Valet? One? If you don't, you should, because what Card Valet does is you can log or register your, your debit and credit cards within Card Valet, and every time a purchase is made, or every time a purchase exceeds a preset amount, you can set this all up yourself, you get notified uh, by the mode of your choosing, whether it's text messages or email, and you will get notified the very second a purchase is made on your account. So if all of a sudden a purchase for $600, for maybe it was for like a gift card or something at Target, and you're sitting at home watching TV, and you see a card pop up on Card Valet, or you see a notification pop up, and it says, a purchase was just made for $600 at Target, that's going to tell you right there that something is not right. And it gives you the opportunity to, uh, within the app, you can shut your card off right there. There's like an on-off switch to freeze your card. Very convenient. It's a, it's a tool that I think that everybody should be using. Most banks have some version of this that they offer. 
and it's something that we should be taking advantage of because we need to be monitoring our accounts on a consistent basis. Whether it's your credit card, whether it's your debit card, your checking account, you should be logging into your online banking on a consistent basis. You should be logging into your credit card account online uh, on a consistent basis and checking your balance and make sure that there aren't any fraudulent charges on there, right? Does anybody, has anybody heard of Samsung, Samsung Pay, Android Pay, or Apple Pay? Have you heard of it? Okay. Does anybody use it? Okay. I have to admit, I, I have to train myself to use it as well. It's a great technology. But the true benefit of using one of these three is that when you make a purchase, so when you set these up, you uh, just like with Card Valet, you register your cards with Samsung Pay, Apple Pay, Android Pay. You register those. Okay. After you register your cards, you can use your phone and hold it over the point of sale device and choose which card on your app that you want to use. But the real benefit, other than not having to carry your credit card or debit card with you, is that the number that gets transferred to the point of sale system is not your actual credit card number. It's called uh, tokenization. It's a one-time use number for that specific transaction. So if that point of sale system, like the ones at Chipotle or Sonic or Arby's, get compromised, they're going to essentially get a one-time use number that has no value whatsoever, protecting your original debit card or credit card. Okay, So that's the benefit of using a service like this. I encourage you to look into that. It's something that I think is definitely worthwhile. Yes? Is it true that most credit card companies on a fraudulent charge will just write it off and it won't affect the person that owns the card? Correct. So the, the problem, the problem, or as the question was, is if uh, a fraudulent charge is made on your credit card or debit card, on your credit card, if the uh, the institution will write it off, right? That was the question. The the answer is yes, you know, for that. But the, but the the main issue is is you have to report it. So if you wait a year to report an incident like that, um, most banks and credit card issuers will put a stipulation on there that you have to report it within X number of days. And if you don't, then they're not on the hook for reimbursing you for that fraudulent charge. That's a great question. You will also be on the phone for right. days. Not to mention the amount of time that you're going to sit on the phone. Yeah. Correct. Also away and then phone call. Right. And that's not a fun way to spend your time. Now I'm going to pick on Facebook a little bit. But in reality, I'm going to speak to social media as a whole. Now, I don't know if anybody in this room has uh, read the articles about uh, Facebook has kind of been dragged through the mud recently because of the whole Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal that went on. And that had to do with uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, falsely. Um, Facebook has a program where if you are um, a learning institution, and if it's for research, they give you access to Facebook user information. Cambridge Analytica falsified that, ended up using it to sell information. So they skimmed and scraped information from 87 million Facebook accounts, used that, sold it to the Trump campaign so they could target ads towards specific people. I mean, that's, that's really in a nutshell what happened. So, <clears throat> but this can happen on multiple platforms, not just Facebook. Information that you should never share on social media. Not just Facebook, any social media. Your birthday. Now these are the, the top four things on here are things that Facebook asks you for when you set up a Facebook account. Give us a little bit of information about yourself. And then that information gets shared with everybody that views your Facebook page. Your birthday, your home address, your phone number, your place of employment. Why would you, want, why would you not want that information to be shared with everyone? It's great on Facebook, right, to have your birthday on there and to have all of your loved ones and maybe some of your friends that aren't such close friends tell you happy birthday on your birthday. That's great. But you've also put that piece of information out there forever. So anybody that wants to look up your information can all of a sudden grab your birthday. Now, a birthday in and of itself is not the most important piece of information, but you pair that up with a couple other pieces of information and you have a problem on your hands. Travel plans. Why should you not post your travel plans 
on social media. I'm speaking to a group of travelers. Why should we not put that information out on social media? Yeah, somebody can come rob your house. Wow, they're all in China. They're not coming back for a while. Let's send in the squad. Let's rob them blind. If you want to post things on travel, wait until after you get back. Wait until you get home to share all of your pictures on social media with all of your friends and loved ones. That's the more sensible way to do it. Don't do it, don't say, on our flight to China with a, you know, with a Bloody Mary in your hand or whatever you're doing because that tells people you're on your way out and you're going to be gone for a long time. Okay? Now this one was, uh, that's come up multiple times and, and there's one that stands out specifically for me. Uh, on Facebook, I've personally given up Facebook. Um, I, I got off Facebook probably about six months ago. My account's still up, but I never gave any of this information on my profile or anything like that. I'm just, I'm done with Facebook, uh, the way that they're selling information. And that's just a personal decision of mine and I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying that that information does get used. Uh, it's not a coincidence that you're searching on the internet and maybe you're on Amazon and you're looking at a specific product and then the second you go onto Facebook there's an advertisement for that product. There's a lot of information being shared across platforms there and it's not just for sales, uh, sales style information. It's concerning to me. I think we're giving up a lot of our privacy to have some convenience. And some of that, I'm not willing to make those compromises, and I can't make that decision for you, but you do need to understand that there is a lot of information about you that you don't know that's being shared and being sold multiple times over. Now, there was a survey that recently uh, came up on Facebook that my wife came across, and it was just one of these fun little surveys, or that's how it, it basically built itself. Hey, let's start a thread. What was, what was the first make and model of your car? And then everybody's filling in in the comments section. Oh, mine was a, mine was a 19, 1969 Mustang. And another person pops on, they're like, oh, I had, a, I had a 1980 Thunderbird. It was a great car. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I, I can't believe that people don't see through what's going on here. So have you guys ever been locked out of an account and you forgot your password? <laughs> How do you recover that password? What's one of the main ways that a lot of sites will help you recover a password? Security questions. What's one of the security questions that you often see when you're trying to recover your password? What was the make and model of your first car? Ah, oh, I'm shocked, right? So the information that just seems like it's all fun and carefree I almost guarantee you the person that was behind it, that started that, has now got a running list. And I bet that person is also sending friend requests to the people that responded to that survey so they can get access to their Facebook profile so they can get their birthday, their home address, their phone number, their place of employment, so on and so forth, so they can build a profile of information to use against you. Okay, food for thought. Let's talk about passwords. First thing I'm going to say about passwords is passwords need to die a quick, painful death because they're just not a very secure way of protecting your information. There's so many better ways to protect your information out there, and the technology exists to uh, crack people's passwords. Now, that's not to say that we should throw passwords by the wayside and throw our hands up and just create easy passwords for everything. Most consumers have less than five passwords to protect all of their accounts, and half of them haven't even changed their password in the last five years or longer. How many people in this room use the same password for multiple accounts? Be honest. I'm all, we're all guilty of it. I've done it, right? Okay. Let me give you a little scenario, just one scenario that might change how you, how you think about that procedure or that process. Let's say you use a simple password for your email account, whether that's Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, whatever it might be. And somebody cracks that password and they get access to your email account, okay? What does somebody get once they get into your email? Can they find out where you bank because of emails you're maybe receiving from your bank? Can they find out what social media platforms you're on? 
by seeing the emails that are in your inbox. There's a lot of information that goes through your email. Email is the central hub. So if you're using the same password on multiple accounts and they find out that you bank at Home Federal, they find out that you have a Facebook account, what are they going to do when they try to get into those accounts? What password do you think they're going to try to use? The same password that they use to get into your email. And if you use the same password across multiple platforms, essentially, if one account becomes compromised, they're all compromised, okay? That's why it's very important to have different passwords for everything, okay? And I'm going to elaborate on that, and I'm seeing a lot of looks on faces, and like, I'm not gonna remember 35 different passwords. And the fact that they make me change them every 90 days doesn't make it any easier either. I understand that. And I'm gonna give you a solution to that problem. Jim123. You guys think that's a strong password? I'm so glad you said that. It's not a strong password at all. How about winter18? Exclamation point. Closer. Because most, most criteria, so if you, if a uh, website requires you to create a password, this is going to meet the criteria, right? It's going to tell you you have to use three out of the four categories of uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters, and a minimum of eight characters in length. This meets all of those criteria. This is not a strong password. Using a dictionary term with a number and a symbol on the end is one of the most popular methods to create a password. And these are frequently guessed when somebody tries to get into your account. Is that a strong password? Yes. Could you remember that password? No. Oh, come on. Is that a strong password? I will ha I'm just going to boast a little bit here. I've got a password at work that's an administrator password of mine that is 10 characters longer than this and looks almost exactly like that, not, this isn't my actual password, but looks that random, and I had to commit that to memory. Yeah, I had to create a little song. My coworkers want me to sing the song to them quite a bit, but I refuse to do it. The team at Splash Data analyzed more than 5 million passwords that were stolen from enterprises and leaked to the public in 2016. This is what they found. The top 10 most common passwords used. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's really easy to remember. It's also really easy to guess. The word password, completely unoriginal. They get no points for that. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Football, you know, QWERTY. Another string of numbers, another string of numbers. We find princess in there. And one, two, three, four. None of those are good passwords. Has anybody ever heard of a password manager? No? Okay. These are companies that offer password managers. If you have an uh, Android device, if you have an iPhone, you can go out to the App Store and you can type in password manager and you'll get a bunch of these icons that pop up, companies that want to offer password managers to you. Okay. What exactly does a password manager do? This is kind of, and this might be kind of hard to read, but I'm going to walk you through it a little bit. This is kind of what the main screen in a password manager looks like. And basically the whole theory or the whole process behind a password manager is that you let the password manager do the heavy lifting for you. You let the password manager create the passwords. You let the password manager remember the passwords. And then all you have to do when you're logging into your online account is you pull up your mass password manager. Most password managers use your biometrics, so to get into them, you can just scan your thumbprint to get into it on your uh, most newer iPhones and uh, Android devices have you know, fingerprint scanning on the, on the devices. So that'll get you into the password manager. Up here you might see a, a dice up here. Basically what that does is you hit that dice and it's going to run a random algorithm that creates a completely randomized password. No rhyme or reason. Look at the password it generated here. 1-A-N-X-5-A-M-0 exclamation point 5-B-G series of uppercase lowercase letters. That's a really strong password. Okay. So let this do the heavy lifting for you. Create and save your passwords in here. That way you can say, I have a legitimate, unique password for every account that I have, and I'm going to let the password manager hold on to it. Now I know the question that you're going to ask me, how safe is this if I am going to put all of my passwords into one location? 
doesn't that make me more susceptible? I understand that concern. My answer to that is that the companies that host this information, they used beyond military grade encryption. They don't even know what your passwords are because when this file that gets backed up on their system gets sent to them, it's encrypted before it ever reaches them and they don't have the decryption key to decrypt the file. So if this, if this company gets compromised and somebody gets onto their network, how is somebody going to get past above military grade encryption and, and, and obtain the decryption key to decrypt that information? More than likely they're not. And I would much rather trust my information here than trust a weak password everywhere else, okay? And the beauty of this is that it is backed up. If you lose your phone, you can log on to their website. The only thing that I ask is that you use a very, comp they have a backup password for these and you do need to create a complicated password and use that as your master password, okay? But there's, there's, there's ways to do that. So let's say you have a, a verse to a song that you really like, okay? Sing that song to yourself and use the first letter of every word in the lyrics of that song, right? It's all, it appears randomized when you look at it. Throw some symbols in there. Instead of an A, use an at symbol. Instead of uh, um, an I, use an exclamation point. Uh, randomize it to some effect. It, it appears random to anybody else, but it has personal meaning to you. Um, and that's, that's how we can do that. But most of these, again, you're going to use biometrics to get in to your password manager. And biometrics, I would not have trusted them about five years ago, but they have come such a long way now. I do trust them now. Password tips. Never give out your password. Don't use the same password for multiple accounts. Don't use passwords made from dictionary words. Change your passwords frequently and use two-factor authentication when available. Does anybody know what two-factor authentication is? Okay. So if you have any company, any logon, any app that you use that when you set it up, they will tell you, we offer two-factor authentication. Would you like to set this up now? Set it up from the very beginning. It'll take you an extra minute or two, but it is infinitely more secure than a password by itself. What is two-factor authentication? Two-factor authentication is the combination of something you know, something you have, or something you are. And I'll explain that a little bit. Something you know, usually most two-factor authentication starts with the password, okay? That's the starting point, you have a password. The something you have might be your cell phone. And what that means is you give, when you set up two-factor authentication, you give them your mobile number, and the second you go to sign in and you type in your password, they text you a code or they email you a code that's good for five minutes maybe. And so then you put in your password and you put in that temporary code that they give you, and that's how you get into your account. Those two items together make it a lot more stronger. If somebody has your phone or somebody has your password, what are the odds that they also have your phone? right? Or vice versa. So that's two hurdles that they now have to jump in order to get into your account. Now there is this or in here for something you are. So instead of something you have like your phone, it could be something you are like biometrics. It could be, um, I know it sounds far-fetched, but we're starting to get here, uh, retina scans, uh, fingerprint scans, those types of things. That's the something you are. So it could be a password and a thumbprint scan. That's two-factor authentication. And again, if you're using an account or a service that offers that, I highly encourage you to sign up for it and use it. Let's talk a little bit about, yep, we have a question? Uh, what happens when you have to uh, get a new phone or something? You, if you get a new phone, most of the time when you get a new phone, you're keeping your original number, and so that wouldn't change. But if you, uh, if you do, for whatever reason, get issued a new number, then you could go in. Most of the um, login accounts or the accounts that you have, there's a section, the security section after you log in under your account. And, and any of the customer service reps for whatever company you're dealing with can walk you through this. But there's a way to change the device that you use for your secondary device. Yep. You also must be the owner of that phone. In some cases, especially with the IRS, if you set that up, you must be the owner correct. Of so, he's saying that you have to be the owner of that phone. That is correct. So, in certain instances, you can't you can't give out somebody else's phone number. It has to be an actual phone number that's tied to you. Yep, absolutely. What is social engineering? 
Social engineering is the use of deception to manipulate individuals into divulging confidential or personal information that may be used for fraudulent purposes. There is no technology today that cannot be defeated by social engineering. Frank Abagnale. Little catch me if you can. There you go. There you go. So here's an example, and I, again, I apologize with the size of the screens here. You're not necessarily going to be able to read these, but I, I will walk you through this. This is what's called a phishing email. And I'm sure you've been on the receiving end of multiple phishing emails. Maybe you haven't known it. So in this case, I'm just going to have an example here or, or uh, throw out a scenario. Let's say I get this. I, I'm talking about me personally. Let's say I get this email, and all of a sudden, I, I open it up and I read, unfortunately, the delivery of your order, and it gives an order number, which is a link that you can click on, says was canceled since the specified address of the recipient was not correct. You are recommended to complete this form and send it back with your reply to us. Please do this within a period of one week. If we don't get your timely reply, you will be paid back your money less 21% since your order was booked for Christmas. Let's say I didn't order anything from Costco. What would you do if you got this email? Delete it. Thank you. Don't do anything with it. Delete it. Okay. The second you click on these links, you could have malware installed on your computer. It's that simple. Just all they have to do is get you to click on a link. Okay. But think about all the other red flags that are in this email. Okay. Look up top. The email address that it's actually coming from is manager at cbcbuilding.com. Why would Costco's official email address be manager at cbcbuilding.com? I'm not saying that by itself is the biggest red flag. I'm just saying that would raise my eyebrow a little bit. Why wouldn't it be Costco, Costco customer service or Costco at customerservice.com or you know something to that effect? But we're not seeing that here. Here they're also telling you uh, that it was canceled. You have to reply quickly. If you don't reply quickly, we're going to charge you 21%. What are they trying to do? trying to scare you, they're trying to create a sense of urgency, right? A false sense of urgency. And so you're sitting here thinking, I didn't order anything. I don't have an account with Costco. I better check this out and see what it is. You'd be surprised how many people have that mentality. And they start clicking away. And then they wonder why their account, their computer has malware on it, and all of a sudden some of their passwords start getting stolen and some weird things start to happen. It's because of phishing emails like this. I train our employees on this all the time. Luann can attest to this. I preach it. You need to know where these emails are coming from. If the context, if you get an email that has no context to it, and it just says, hey, check out this link, and it gives you a link, don't click on the link. If you don't know who it's from, even if you do know who it's from, but the verbiage in the email is not consistent with the type of language that you would see in an email from that person, question the email. You'd be surprised how many times I get phone calls from people that say, I got an email from so-and-so, he sends me emails twice a week, and I got this email from him, and all it was was a link in an email, and I clicked on it. And then I called him, and he said his account was compromised, and uh, phishing emails went out to everybody on his contact list. I hear it all the time. I just had one yesterday that one of our vice presidents contacted me, and he said it was an email from somebody that he gets emails from weekly. And he said, I got this email from this person, what should I do with it? I said, delete it. There's no context. He's not even telling you what it is. Why would somebody send you an email with a blank link? Here you go. That doesn't make any sense. It's like sending a letter and putting like a couple words in it, just giving it to somebody. Yes? Is it wise to delete it out of the deleted file right away too rather than let it sit in your system? Sure. The question was, is, is it wise to delete the email right away? I said, yes, delete it. Get rid of it. Right. That way a loved one, spouse doesn't go in there and, oh, hey, what's this? And click on the link and all of a sudden you got a problem. You knew you shouldn't have done it, but maybe the other one didn't. Let's look at another one. And again, I, I, I will kind of read through these a little bit. This one is from a, or supposedly from a credit union. And it basically just talks about, hey, dear valued member, due to concerns with safety and integrity of the online banking community, we have issued the following warning message. It has come to our attention that your account's information has need to be confirmed due to inactive customers, fraud and spoof reports. I'm just, I'm going to stop right there. 
What is one of the number one telltale signs that an email is a phishing email? And I, and I stopped right after I read it. Poor grammar, right? Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick on pick on that necessarily as as being uh, an always red flag. But if you start seeing the the grammar in some of these, um, a lot of the phishing emails that we see that come in uh, don't necessarily generate from within the United States. So maybe English is not the first language for the person that constructed the email. Okay. And it should be a dead giveaway when you start seeing lots of spelling and grammatical errors because if this is supposedly an official correspondence, piece of correspondence from an organization, don't you think that's going to pass through multiple hands or multiple sets of eyes are going to look at it before it actually gets issued, meaning kind of proofreading, editing, things like that, so it has that professional nature to it? This one clearly doesn't. And it also gives you a link down here to click on. Um, up, up top where it says Dear Valued Member, Kind of another giveaway is if they don't put your name in the email. If they don't know who you are, chances are your email address was just on some list and they just blanketed that email off to as many people as they could. They don't know your name, but they're going to put something in there like Dear Valued Member to try to get your attention. There's also a false sense of security in this one and there's a link in here as well. So things to keep on the, keep on the lookout for. Now. When you've been surfing on the internet, how many people have seen something pop up like this? Suspicious activity found, gives you a phone number to call. More times than not, there is no malware on your computer. This is just a pop-up that pops up. They want you to call the number. You call the number, they try to get, they say that they're gonna send you an email with a link. The link in the email gives them remote access to your computer so they can remote into your computer into your computer, pretend to fix your problem for you, but in reality they're stealing your information. Okay? Just be wary of these types of things. Okay? You're not paying, if you don't have a contract with support for somebody, then don't think that something, excuse me, something that magically pops up on your computer that you should call that number and let that, give that person access to your computer. It's, it's just another version of the same scam. I'm almost wrapping up here. Um, I did get, and I threw this in here at the last minute, I did have a client of ours that had signed up to be a mystery shopper, okay? And this is, you know, you know what mystery shoppers are. You go in and you uh, just pretend like you're a normal customer. You purchase a product and you report on the experience that you have, fill out a survey, all that type of inf information. Well, this person filled this out, information signed up. Uh, she sought the company out online, responded to them. They sent a packet to her with a check for, I think it was like $2,300, right? And in this long convoluted letter that they got, what they wanted this person to do was go deposit that check into their bank account, it was a cashier's check, and then within the same day, transfer lots of cash out from Walmart to Walmart cash transfer the same day. Now why would they want you to transfer that money the same day? The check hasn't cleared yet. Right? And all of a sudden that money's gone and this person's left holding the bag. But one thing that I wanted to point out, this is some of the verbiage that was in the letter that she received. Mystery shopper job is a chain that work all around the global. Once you have the funds sent out, it will be picked up by a shopper agent, which he, she will deduct a commission and have the reset send out to another agent till the funds got exhausted this allow us to have more report on different locations. That's exactly how it appeared. That's what the punctuation and spelling looked like. If you read that, what would you do? Throw it in the garbage, right? So all of this information that I'm giving you, I, I, it begs the question, who's looking out for you? Who's, who's on your side? I mean. Yeah, if you call, like for example, you call Home Federal and you let us know what your problem is. I mean, we're in your corner, we're going to help you. But ultimately, on the proactive side, aside from identifying you know, fraudulent uh, transactions on your account that uh, um, Home Federal would notify you about, but a lot of organizations that you do business with, who's looking out for you? Nobody's looking out for you. We live in a capitalistic economy. Do you think in this economy that, the, that they really care to, to a full extent? It's more, the Equifax thing just goes to show us that it's about money in those regards. And, and especially with the executives that were trying to cut and run and cash out their stock options before the news hit the, hit the wire. 
So who's looking out for you? You have to look out for yourself, okay? Is the sky falling? No, the sky is not falling. That we will always go, we live in the age of information. And in the age of information comes convenience. And with convenience comes how much of your personal information do you want to give up for that convenience, okay? It's no different than going out and buying an Alexa device that you put in your house where you give it voice commands and it tells you or it plays songs back, but you do realize that that device is always listening, right? That kind of scares me a little bit, just a little bit. Convenience comes at a price and you have to look out for yourself and you have to protect your information. You have to do what you can and educate yourself and that's how you do it, awareness and education. I strongly encourage you to stay up, up to date on current events, read the news. And almost every article that you read about a security breach or information that got leaked out to the public, within those articles will give you guidelines on what you can do now to protect yourself. So you have to educate yourself, you have to stay current on, uh, stay open on current events, stay up to date, because that's where you're gonna get the information that you need. Do we have any questions? Yes, go ahead. Okay. You recommended um, a car Yes. And all these go through your cell phone. How secure are the apps on your cell phone and can they be scanned? Okay, so the question was I recommended, I recommended uh, Apple Pay, Android Pay, Samsung Pay, uh, Card Valet, and how secure are those apps because it's on your cell phone. Okay. Now, most of those products that I've, uh, that I've recommended to you, those are by major manufacturers that have standards and guidelines that they have to abide by uh, financially or they have auditing with the government that they have to abide by for those things, especially with the credit card information. I would have no issue using those, those items um, just like I wouldn't with the, with the password managers. Now that's not to say that anything, I, I, I can't promise that anything is 100% secure but I would have no issue with that. And the fact of the matter is, is that again, the information that's being passed from those, um, from those apps is not your actual credit card number. So that's where the safety comes in there. That's the trade-off. You put your, your information in there, and then every time you make a purchase, it's not actually using your credit or debit card number. And then the card valet, card valet is something that's being used by mul multiple institutions, not just Home Federal. Um, that's one that um, you can use multiple bank debit cards and credit cards with. And that's something that I, I know is a product that's backed by multiple financial institutions. And again, the auditing that goes behind that um, is it's not just something run of the mill. It's something where there's, there's major auditing in place and that if, if there were an issue, it, it would get shut down. So I guess that's the best I can answer that question. Yes, go ahead. Does it help to block this so the question was is, is in relation to, to blocking junk mail, right? And should you, should you block it all, basically all the stuff that, that typically comes in during a business week or Monday through whenever? Personally, what I do is I have a set contact list, right? People, I, I have approved companies that I do, that I have contact, or that I get emails from, and I just have an approved contact list, and I only receive emails from that. Everybody else goes into spam. If a company sends me an email and they say, be on the lookout for this email, it's coming your way, I might have to go check my spam folder because may, maybe it ended up there, but I'd rather do that than have to sift through everything. So yeah, I think probably putting everything in spam is it's personally probably one of the better ways to handle it. Okay. Well, thank you.